and a very warm welcome to today's investment coffee break. Now, last time I spoke with Guy Foster, our chief strategist, and he was giving us his thoughts as to the year ahead. And today we really want to build on that. I'm joined by Adam Jarvis and Joy Moyer, two of our investment managers from our Winchester office. And um, Joy, perhaps uh, I can start with you. Could you start by giving us a view of the investment landscape? Yes, of course. So in order to set the scene, it is helpful to have a look back at what's been going on over the last decade or so. So if we have a look at interest rates and the relation between interest rates and markets, that can be quite a helpful place to start. So on our graph, we can see interest rate trends over the last 20 years or so. So the red line shows the level of interest rates over time, and that time period is around 20 years on the x-axis there. So we can see that over time for the last two decades or so, interest rates have been falling and we can see the downward trend of this red line. And that's the environment we've been used to. And then if we look at global stock markets over the same time period, which is depicted by the blue line, we can see that generally world stock markets have been trending upwards and broadly speaking, they've been performing well. So the reason behind markets going up whilst interest rates are going down is partly due to the fact that low interest rates can hide a multitude of sins. So companies may not be over, overly profitable, but they have been able to survive. And this is because it's been free and relatively easy to borrow money when interest rates have been so low. So looking back, we've had this relatively unusual environment of low to negative interest rates over a prolonged period. However, if we were to extrapolate out this graph to include 2022, then we'd see quite a different story. So we'd see a sharp rise in interest rates during 2022, and this rise has sent equities and bonds down. Okay, so obviously we've seen interest rates dropping and as you mentioned, uh, ticking up at the end uh, for uh, last year in particular. Uh, do we see interest rates dropping back perhaps to the level that they were previously? Um, we believe actually that now we're heading into quite a different environment. So whereas we have seen interest rates falling over the last 20 years or so, we don't expect them to go back to the lows that we have been used to over the last few decades. And that's really because interest rates were at a very unusually low level. They were at their lowest level for some 350 years. So the short answer to your question is no, we are expecting interest rates to remain higher for longer. So it's quite helpful again to look at a graph on this. And this graph on screen shows interest rate expectations from some of the leading economists. So if we look at the blue line this time, we can see that interest rate levels on the Y axis, we can see this over time from 2020 onwards on the X axis. And what we can see this time is that in 2022, there was this steep rise in interest rates in the US, but it's a very similar story in the UK as well. And then on the dotted lines, we can see interest rate expectations, which, is act which have actually been revised downwards since 2023. But it's not so much the exact figure of where we expect interest rates to get to that's key here. What's more key is the trend that we're seeing. And that trend that we're expecting is for interest rates to remain elevated from their previous decade lows and for that to last for the foreseeable future. So we're actually going into a very different environment to what we've been used to for the last few decades. This means higher costs of borrowing for companies and actually a more normal environment where there are these heightened interest rates from even negative or very, very low interest rates that we've seen previously. And what this means for us then, and our approach is that we want to carefully select specific stocks. Um, we want companies that we feel are quality and resilient in their own right, because they can then weather these new backdrops that we're seeing, they can 
be more resilient, they can have these strong balance sheets. And ultimately, if interest rates are going to remain elevated as we're expecting, they can weather those headwinds. Okay, thanks, Joy. Um, Adam, perhaps I can bring you in now. Joy mentioned about uh, investing in quality companies. And a, and a question that we often get asked is about uh, tracker uh, funds or say a FTSE 100, a FTSE 100 tracker. Investing in a FTSE 100 tracker, I'd be investing in big quality companies, wouldn't I? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think in order to answer your question, Andy, we, we really need to unpack what you're getting when you invest in a FTSE 100 tracker. Now, to help with this, I I've taken some data from iShares, who are one of the world's largest tracker fund providers owned by BlackRock, and just looking at their FTSE 100 tracker to, to throw a bit more light on this. Now, there's obviously been a number of headlines recently exclaiming how the FTSE 100 has reached a record high, uh, moving to over 8,000 at an index level. However, I think that's got to be taken in the context that it was trading at around 7,000 in the year 2000, so over 20 years ago. So it's not really been the best performing market over the longer term. Shorter term though, I mean, over the last year, the FTSE 100 has done well um, and, and much better than most other developed markets due to the type of companies and sectors that it's exposed to. So to put some wider context on this, the, the chart on the left shows the makeup of the iShare FTSE 100 tracker, where you can see there is a large exposure to the energy sector, which is oil, materials, which are commodities, mining companies, and financials, which obviously include banks. Now they all did very well um, over the last year, uh, and there's virtually no exposure you can see there to, to the information technology, the IT sector, which performed badly uh, you know, on a global scale last year after uh, a number of years previously that had been much, much better. Also, I think importantly, given that the, the, the FTSE 100 is dominated by a few very large companies, you're also getting 50% exposure. That's half the money you invested into the top 10 stocks shown on the right. Now, I think the question is, do you want to be blindly invested in those stocks and sectors at a time when the economy is struggling and slowing down? Now, there's certainly a time and a place for trackers, and we will buy them. But at the moment, we, we don't want these large exposures to areas that are more economic, economically sensitive, uh, particularly oil and commodities that tend to go down in, in a recession. Uh, we also certainly wouldn't want to invest sort of half of 50% you know, of clients' money in just 10 stocks and prefer to cherry pick the companies where we see much stronger prospects that are not impacted by just one factor, for instance, the oil price. So we're therefore happy to own, say, Unilever, Diageo, Glaxo, SmithKline, which are, which are in that top 10. However, we struggle to see sort of longer term growth opportunities in British American tobacco, uh, for example. So that said, and we do believe that certain parts of the UK stock market look attractive. Um, however, that's mainly through a more globally exposed high quality companies that we can buy on a discount to other similar companies listed on other markets. So for instance, Unilever, uh, which is listed there, is trading you know, around 25%, a quarter cheaper than Procter & Gamble, which is an equivalent company listed on the US stock market. So, so there are opportunities in the UK, uh, but I think the summary is we just don't think now's the time for big exposures to, to oil, commodities and banks. Okay, you, you mentioned uh, banks there and quite timely actually, isn't it? HSBC is on that list and of course they stepped in to uh, to buy the UK arm of, of Silicon Valley Bank and of course we've seen the UBS uh, bail out uh, Credit Suisse in Europe. What's our view currently on banks? Because the markets have been a little bit spooked. So, I mean, I first, I think it's fair to say, I mean, as I mentioned before, I mean, we have very little exposure to banks in, in the portfolio. We've really got a preference for uh, electronic payment providers, such as Visa and Adyen, um, which, which, you know, that, those items are actually up over the past couple of weeks. So they're in the financial sector, but, but, but very different to, to banks. But I think, you know, in terms of our wider view, I, I think it's quite important to make the distinction between what's happening now and, say, the financial crisis, which many people are talking about, you know, back in 2008, governments and taxpayers were effectively asked to bail out the banks. However, this time, the banks themselves have stepped in, UBS have stepped in here, uh, and, and the private sector has, has sort of dealt with the situation uh, with assistance from the, the relevant authorities. So the regulation that was put in place and, and the requirement on these banks to, to put more capital aside 
um, you know, has done its job, that has worked, we think, especially in the case of the most, you know, the biggest, largest, most systemically important banks. So at the moment, it really looks like more uh, specific company issues rather than a much deeper issue. However, I think it's yeah, fair to say interest rates rising at the pace they did, which Joy mentioned earlier, is always going to lead to sort of unknown consequences. And there will be other things, no, no, no doubt, but we don't think there'll be to necessarily the extent that, that would cause a, a much wider financial uh, issues from, from that perspective. Um, I think this is also an example of a situation you know, where we can take advantage of that sort of uncertainty and, and buy you know, some high quality companies in order to make long term gains, um, you know, not too dissimilar from, from what Warren Buffett preaches, be greedy when others are fearful. So we, you know, we use that opportunity where the broader financial sector sold off um, and a number of really high quality companies included in that. And, and one of those we actually decided to, to, to buy, and that was Charles Schwab uh, in, in certain portfolios. So I mean, it's a company that we, we followed uh, along with our analysts for, for some time. Um, and for those that have not heard of the company, Charles Schwab is a, a US diversified financial services company. It's got around seven trillion in client assets, so really huge, huge company with you know a, a pretty uh, traditional asset gatherer. You know, with, with um, they do have some banking operations, but it's much more of a securities a brokerage company, money management, and financial advisory services. Um, so you know, we, we don't think they're in a similar position to um, Silicon Valley Bank, for instance. It's a much more stable client base. You know, around 80% of the, the deposits that are held there are covered by the US insurance limits, similar to what we have in the UK. Um, and they've also got 100, over $100 billion of cash on the balance sheet. And they've been, in the last week, they've seen $16.5 billion of new money come in. So the clients clear, of them clearly haven't been spooked, but they're confident. And, and also the management team of Charles Schwab are, are very confident as well. And, and they've, uh, they've actually bought around $7 million of shares between them, including the CEO, over the last couple of weeks. So, uh, you know, we, we had the confidence to to invest, and, and you know, with the company falling over thirty percent, um, you know, we've seen that as a good opportunity uh, for, for clients where we can take a slightly longer term term view of a company that looks looking very attractively valued at the moment. Okay, thanks, Adam. Joy, can I come back to you? Uh, you were talking right at the beginning, actually, about uh, interest rates. Uh, increasing and of course that has led to uh, cash rates for uh, savings accounts in building societies and banks increasing suddenly that's become more attractive to clients hasn't it so why wouldn't clients just invest in the bank what what's uh, what's the reason for them looking at investing in RBC Brew and Dolphin Yes, well, it is a good question, given this new interest rate environment that we're in. And pleasingly, we can all get some returns on cash deposits now. So if you look at high street banks, they're offering somewhere around 3%. Um, so returns are to be had on cash deposits. In our view, however, it's often been seen that cash deposits return less than inflation. And if you're earning less than inflation on your cash deposits, then this is still eroding the purchasing power of your money over time. Whereas if you do invest in stock markets and have some equities within your portfolio, they tend to outperform inflation over the longer term. And they also tend to generate returns over and above interest rates over the long term. So even if portfolios to a return only a few percent above interest rates, through the power of compounding, this can make quite a big difference over time. So if we just use an example to look at this and say you invested £100,000 in over 10 years and you got a 3% return in that time, then through compounding, your £100,000 would be worth £134,000 at the end of that time period. So you then invested that same amount of money, but you got a return of 6%, which is arguably more like what portfolios return over the long term, then your money would be worth more like £180,000 at the end of that time period. So it's a substantial difference over time. In that example, there's about £46,000 between the two returns, even if you're just comparing 3% versus 6%, and that's because of compounding. 
So in our view, again, we can use higher interest rates as opportunities in our portfolios. We can add bonds, we can have some of those higher returns on cash or cash-like deposits, but we prefer to blend them with equities and with alternatives. That means that you spread your risk over different um, asset types, and also it means that you can grow over the longer term with the view of outpacing inflation. And again, as we've been mentioning, we would always do that with a bit more of a focus on quality at this time. Okay, thank you, Joy. Adam, thank you to you. And thank you for watching. We hope you found that useful. Please do keep your thoughts and your questions coming. We do try and cover as much as we can in the short time that we have available. We very much hope that you can join us again for the next Investment Coffee Room.